This is a production of Cornell University. My name is Nikki Chopra. And I'm Nishan Trivedi. And we are co-chairs of the Sick in America series. We'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. It is not only the kickoff of the Sick in America series, but it is also the first ever presidential lecture series on current affairs. We've been working with a board of 15 enthusiastic students for about six months planning this week's events. Um, and we're thrilled that you could come to our first one. This, this series could not have been possible without the help of Dr. Richard Kiley, Dr. Rob Burledge, and of course, President Scorton. Uh, this series is the first of its kind as it unites the perspectives and interests of over 12 undergraduate health organizations. Uh, under the umbrella of the Cornell Undergraduate Health Cooperative, also started this semester, we hope to present the Sick in America series as a holistic overview of the problems facing the healthcare system in America, as well as the potential solutions. And now, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Garson, please give a warm round of applause for President Scorton. Um, can you join me in thanking uh, Nishant and Nikki and all the students who made this possible? It's really a terrific thing. <laughs> and if you, uh, if you have a chance to look at this uh, brochure, uh, you'll see the, all the things that these group of uh, student groups, the group of groups, has brought together. And uh, it also links together the two campuses in a way that, you know, has been a very high priority of ours for a couple of years. And you'll notice that uh, next week on the 30th of April, there's an event uh, at, uh, in New York City, uh, Business and Medicine Symposium, that's going to be simulcast uh, in Sage Hall in B10. So I hope everybody will have a chance not only to enjoy tonight, which I'm sure you will, uh, but also to enjoy the rest of the series. And um, uh, again, uh, uh, Nishant and Nikki, thank you for making this possible. Very exciting. Uh, tonight's lecture, uh, as, uh, as Nishant and Nikki mentioned, is also the kickoff for a new series of uh, lectures, which we're going to sponsor out of my office, to bring faculty uh, to the university to talk about uh, current affairs. And the reason we're going to do that is really twofold. The first reason is that uh, even in this time of uh, financial duress, where you hear so much uh, at this university and that other universities like it, about all the things that we cannot do right now, uh, we have to remember that one of the things that we can do is to continue to support the intellectual ferment of a university and to, uh, where it's appropriate, talk about things relevant to the world beyond the campus walls. And so the purpose of, uh, the purpose, the first purpose of doing this series is to do that, is to look forward and to look up, to cast our eyes up, and to do it in an area that's relevant to, uh, to the world around us. And we're going to start tonight, as I'll tell you in just a moment, in one of the areas of greatest concern to virtually all facets of American society, from the business society to all of us as individuals, to a place like Cornell as an employer. The second reason for, uh, for uh, starting this new uh, presidential lecture series is that um, I believe very strongly that the land-grant universities like Cornell uh, have as part of their public mission work that we can do to help the country and the state and the region dig itself out from the dilemma that we're in. And uh, once again, one of the things that's uh, contributing very substantially to that dilemma is the dilemma that we have in health care, health care delivery, and public health in general. So for those two reasons, it's a thrill that the uh, students who set this up allowed me to uh, dovetail the first of these presidential lectures on current affairs with this. So I thank you very much for your graciousness. I also want to announce for those of you who think even this part of the thing is already too long and you're thinking, do I really have to stay for this? That uh, we're going to have dessert and it's been uh, <laughs> the students who understand all these kind of things you know, very well know that they have to do this in a very strategic way. So rather than bringing the food in right now so you could eat, get your fill and leave, they have the dessert coming at the end of Dr. Garson's presentation. So you'll have this very tough internal dilemma where you'll have to decide, <laughs> is it more important to sit through this no matter how painful and have dessert or give them both up? And I can see it in your eyes that you're already, already conflicted about it. So now let me convince you that it's worth staying even if we didn't have dessert. It's a great pleasure, a professional and a personal pleasure to introduce 
an old friend of mine, and that doesn't mean that he's old, just that we've known each other for a long time, uh, a colleague in pediatric cardiology and in broader aspects of academia, uh, Arthur Garson, Jr. He goes by Tim. Um, and he's a very uh, uh, eclectic, open person. He's told me tonight that you can refer to him as your eminence. You don't have to call him uh, Dr. <laughs> Garson. Uh, Tim Garson is uh, uh, one of the country's very, very prominent uh, pediatric cardiologists and had a hugely distinguished career as a, a probably the most uh, honored living a practitioner of pediatric cardiology as it relates to the electrical activity of the heart, literally wrote the book, a huge three-volume tome uh, that was and is the, uh, the, the uh, Bible, the last word on, um, on pediatric electrophysiology. Uh, he was president of the American College of Cardiology and uh, hugely known uh, literally throughout the world. Somewhere uh, along the uh, trail of uh, pursuing this very distinguished career, uh, Tim Garson began to see beyond the confines of the examining room where he was working, of the classroom where he was teaching, and of the university uh, hospital or medical school that he was uh, helping to lead. And he saw the importance of thinking more broadly about public health, about health care delivery, and about the larger issues that not only affect that interaction between doctor and patient, but affect so many things in our country. Uh, went back and got further training um, and uh, another degree, and then uh, reinvented himself as one of the country's leaders in uh, an aspect of public health. This is very important for two reasons, not only uh, having to do with his bona fides for sharing his ideas with us tonight, but to the students, um, a few of, of whom I was talking with just a few minutes ago about this, to imagine your career not only as you might see it through the lens of today as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior about to go out into the world, but through the lens of thinking that uh, you've learned skills that will allow you to adapt to your changing interest and to the changing needs of the world. And it would be hard to imagine someone who has followed that siren call of change and need uh, better than Tim Garson. Tim graduated Phi Beta Kappa and summa cum laude from Princeton. He went on to earn his MD from Duke University where he also did his residency in pediatrics. He completed his pediatric cardiology fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, one of the very finest in this area, and then got his MPH from the University of Texas uh, in Houston. Before moving to the University of Virginia uh, at 2002 as vice president and dean of the School of Medicine, he had high-level posts at several other institutions, including Duke, Baylor, and the Texas Children's Hospital. In addition to his leadership in medical education and as a clinician, he has been deeply involved in health policy. Um, Tim served on the White House panel on health policy and chaired the National Advisory Council of the Agency for Health Care Research and Quality. He chaired the Health Care Program Subcommittee of Virginia's Blue Ribbon Commission on Health Insurance and the Uninsured and served on the Governor of Virginia's Health Reform Commission. He's also been a member of the Institute of Medicine Task Force on Rapid Improvements in the Healthcare System, the Commonwealth Fund Task Force on Health Insurance on the Uninsured, and chaired the American College of Cardiology's Task Force on the Uninsured. At UVA, Tim Garson teaches the introductory health policy course, Myths and Realities of American Healthcare, and his book, Healthcare Half Truths, Too Many Myths, Not Enough Reality, was published in 2007 to great critical acclaim. His topic tonight is healthcare myths and truths. Please join me in welcoming the kickoff speaker of this event and the kickoff speaker of the Presidential Lecture Series, Dr. Tim Garson. It's hard to, this is one of those great times where those of you whose parents might hear something like that, this is the time when you'd say, my father would thank you and my mother would believe you. So thank you, President Scorton. Um, there's part of, we go back a long way. There's actually part of uh, the story that makes sense and, and he may not know it and it's probably worth sharing with you before we get started because I'm about to put you guys to work. This is a you talk to each other and a little bit to me, not me talk to you. So uh, if you're getting ready to think about dessert versus this, you might want to be thinking about that. Uh, I won't call on anybody that doesn't raise their hand, though, so don't worry about that. Um, the first night when I was a trainee in pediatric cardiology in Houston, 
I was taking care of a five-year-old girl who had her, had been born a blue baby, and cardiologists in those days took care of all the post-op patients. Surgeons stayed in the operating room. We took care of them out, outside in the recovery room. She arrested three times that night, and each time she arrested, I went down the hallway and discussed what was going on with her parents and her grandparents. And the first time it was the roughest of, you know, this was their only little girl, and them saying to me, you know, we are trusting you to take care of her. Here I was, a first night trainee. Back and forth three times, art of medicine at one end of the hall, science of medicine at the other end of the hall. And Needless to say, she made it through. We bonded, parents, grandparents, Ginny, me, and traded phone numbers when she finally went home. I went to her grammar school graduation, she lived about 80 miles from Houston, went to her high school graduation, and at about 8.30 on a Sunday morning, about halfway into her 19th year, phone rings, and her mother is hysterical, and she's found her daughter dead in bed. And as we pieced the likely events back together, what it looks like happened is her Medicaid, her public funding, ran out at the age of 19, and she quit taking her medicine that was a drug that was absolutely keeping her alive and never refilled a prescription after the time that her Medicaid ran out. So if you say, why would a sort of, you know, self-assuming pediatric cardiologist get into the uninsured and get into public health, it's a very simple one-person story. But when you hear numbers, like 50 million, and we'll get there awfully soon if we're not there now, 50 million uninsured. Just think about these people are one at a time. These are not 50 million. This is not the population of Australia. This is 50 million individuals. So that got my attention, and that's a little bit the direction that I went, uh, and hopefully over the next several years we'll, we'll make some progress. Now, what I heard very quietly, is that really you had invited Michael Moore. <laughs> and I am, you know, I am delighted that you did. And I thought that, that instead of just showing up and being me, um, I'd <laughs> show up as Michael Moore. Now, if anybody's got real thick glasses, and I'm told the good news is I need a, a little bit of a pillow, but um, I'm happy to at least try to fill in for him in a way that I'm sure that others could do as good or better a job, but, but I'll try, I promise. Now, we're going to do this. We're going to work together here, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to sort of come up with a statement, and you're going to take a vote about whether something is true or something is false, and then we're going to talk about it, okay? Now, Nikki and Nishant helped me to figure out some of the things that might be the most interesting. Perhaps I added one back in that might be a little bit controversial. Um, but let's start with the following. American medical care is second rate compared to other developed countries. Now, you've got to vote, okay? I'm, I'm going to keep track or you don't get dessert. So how many true American medical care is second rate compared to other countries? Way up. Okay, how many false? All right, not bad. Now, here comes another one. Take that hat off, Garson, right, okay. Now here comes, <laughs> okay, Lindsay, take that hat off, right, here we go. American health care is second rate compared to other developed countries. How many true? How many false? And the rest of you are either too hungry to raise your hands or we're not so sure. Okay, who would like to talk about the difference between medical care and health care? 
What's medical care? Somebody, what's medical care? Go. Okay, let me ask this. Right, let me ask a, a, a fact question. Do we need to be getting microphones to people? Um, they can hear? Okay, great. All right. Awful good. Hold that thought. More. What's medical care? Healthcare is the system, medical care is the treatment. Okay, healthcare is the system, medical care is the treatment. All right, more. Yes, sir. Um, medical care treats the needs of the condition or helps the treatment of the patient. Okay. One more. Ah, oh, come on. Who said medical care is terrific? Who, one more time. Medical care is not second rate. Okay. Medical care is not re second rate. So why not? Okay. Okay, so a medical care index, you're gonna, you want me to come back here, right? A medical care index is like breast cancer mortality. That's a medical care index, right? It's what doctors and patients and nurses and other care providers do together. Breast cancer mortality. Now, the life expectancy in Harlem, in New York City, is lower than the life expectancy in Bangladesh. That's true. That's, that's published. The infant mortality in southeast Washington, D.C. is worse than the infant mortality in Nairobi, Kenya. So both of those are true. Health care indices, the major two healthcare indices are life expectancy and infant mortality. So now that we talk, now, what does that mean? Tell me a little bit more. Does that help you to sort of say, okay, I get it. This is what health care is. What's health care? Uh, uh, Wild Cornell, come on. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> Why would you want to go to the Mayo Clinic when you've got Wild Cornell? Go ahead. Okay. There you go. So what infant, here, here's the, the sort of, take it one step further, of life expectancy. In the United States, life expectancy is 40% lifestyle, 30% genetics, 20% public health, 10% medical care. One more time, 40% lifestyle, 30% genetics, 20% public health, 10% medical care. Now, that makes a guy like me go, wow, only 10% of life expectancy is actually due to the stuff that docs and patients and nurses and other, yeah, because think about what's going on with obesity right now. Think about what's going on with smoking, drugs, right? Think about Harlem. Harlem is not medical care. Harlem is drugs, obesity, smoking, murders. That's all life expectancy. That's health care. Okay? 
infant mortality, very complicated. I suspect the, the infant mortality is going to be, we're a long way from understanding infant mortality. Life expectancy, you can at least identify some things. There are people that talk about infant mortality being higher in poverty, higher in alcohol, higher in smoking, higher in African Americans. That's very complicated. My guess is we're going to learn a lot better over the next 10 years about really what, and infant mortality is basically premature babies, little tiny babies. So there's a lot to learn there that probably will turn out to be something we understand and can help, therefore more likely to be medical care than social. But these are complex interactions, as you're talking about, about who gets it, the uninsured, 20% higher mortality between the ages of 19 and 64, 20% higher. So when you say, well, are those related, is medical care and health care related, if you can't get to medical care, you die, and you die sooner. The uninsured get about half the medical care they need. And so life expectancy among the uninsured, worse than life expectancy among the insured. So it's related. So far, so good? All right. Questions? OK, this is about you guys. Not when you can you have dessert. Not ready yet. Um, questions about that? Yes, sir. Nice tie. Absolutely right. I mean, I'll give you one, and I'll get it mainly right, because I just read this and haven't written it down. But there is a statistic, and again, these things are also correlative rather than causative. But the life expectancy, if you don't have a high school, nah, I may have to answer it. He may be calling me. Put it over here. Anywhere. Okay. All right. And you'll give it back to me next week when I forget it. There you go. The life expectancy of people with less than a high school education is hurt worse than the life expectancy diminution from having diabetes. So there are, and that, you know, when you say, well, that, the lack of a high school education doesn't cause you to die, no, but the lack of a high school education certainly likely doesn't get you health insurance. And so these things get very, very correlative. So even obesity, diabetes, um, obesity causing diabetes, there are plenty of articles now that are talking about if we don't start to fix where obesity is going over the next five years, our life expectancy is going to go down in the whole United States for the first time since the Civil War. And it's going to be due to diabetes and heart disease and kidney disease and, and, and those things that, that diabetes causes. So it's complicated. Um, when you then go look at other countries and you say their health care indices are better, so are their prison systems, so the sociologic issue, they've got less people in prison. Uh, they ounce for ounce have less people doing drugs. Um, and so this, this, this whole notion of the social determinants of health, really important. Um, a lot of really good work going on here in that area. So congratulations, a lot of good work going on here in that area. OK, another one. We waste half of our health care dollars. We waste. <laughs> Pretty close, he says. Okay, how many true? We waste half of our health care. How many false? A few more trues. All right. 
the number is around a third, close to a half. And you sort of go, where did that come from? All right, talk to me. If, if I'm going to tell you we waste the number this year for the U.S. health care system, even though the vast majority of that number, they call it national health expenditures. They really mean national medical expenditures. Okay, $2.4 trillion with a T. $800 billion a year wasted. Uh-oh. Where's it come from? Yes, sir. Administ talk some more. Terrific. You got there quick. Go. You're right. Complicated. Uh huh. A little more. Keep talking. Okay, so let's hear a little, let's, it, we're going to say administrative costs. What are the components of administrative costs? When you, we waste a lot of money, and we do. Yeah. Marketing. Uh, Marketing. Marketing. There you go. Pharmaceuticals. Right. More. What do we waste money on? Yes, sir. Sounds like sicko. I need a tiny little room with one computer. And I think that says a lot. So on average in a physician's office, hold that thought, on average in a physician's office, not in big hospitals, but in a physician's office, there are two billing people per one doctor. Okay, so you got 12 docs, you got 24 billing people. Now, there is a very well-known and fun, neat, health economist named Uwe Reinhardt, who's at Princeton. And Uwe gave a talk at the College of Cardiology a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things he said was, you're right to cut out all the waste, just not this year, please, because all of a sudden that's, that means jobs. And it does. Now, this is, an, this is an important point. As you start to think about, we'll get there at the end. Uh, I've got three hours left, right, President? <laughs> okay, okay. There you go, okay. As we start to think about, and we'll get back to the end, about what do you all think is going to happen in, in the next 6 to 12 months, one of the things that people are talking about is where's the money, can you save it, um, and can you really get the money out? Um, the issue, this is an un obviously an unusual time, to be saying, okay, we can save a lot of money, but remember, in the whole healthcare system, and 2.4 trillion is a lot, somebody is going to lose a job if we save money. That's generally a lot of that, a lot of those things we're about to talk about mean that somebody is, is going to make less money, including doctors. Including doctors. So we'll talk about that in a minute. More administrative costs. So now we've got marketing. More? What else? Yeah. Sir, we, go ahead. The lack of a uniform and simple reimbursement structure. Ah, we're complicated. Yeah. Right. That's, you're right, that's tough to quantitate what that means. We can get to administrative, we can get to sort of, we know Medicare has about a 3% administrative cost. We know that the private sector has around a 25 percent administrative cost. That's got a lot of stuff in it, right? That's got inefficiencies, profit. And you know, the, the fun thing about the United States is you don't, you know, we live here. You don't want to all of a sudden say, oh, okay, we're not going to have profit. So that's a really interesting sort of set of issues. Someone talked about pharmaceutical companies. So where does that work or you know do you need the top five pharmaceutical companies to be in the fortune 50 that's a choice america can make or not make so we are in a for-profit society doctors make money hospitals make money lawyers make money um, and so while we have a lot of 
not-for-profit hospitals, medical schools, those still have to, while they're not turning money around for shareholders, they clearly have to take money in to put it on the bottom line to buy capital equipment. So it is not perfectly, you know, it, it, it isn't just let's stop doing a number of things. What we clearly want to stop doing is having paper billing. We'll figure out how to train those people to do something else. We certainly don't want to do that. And you will hear a lot about electronic medical records over the next several years. Um, the stimulus funding did a really interesting thing. The stimulus funding that came out set up new rules where doctors for the next four years are going to get paid extra to put electronic medical records into their practice. And in the fifth year, in, after 2014, they're going to get penalized. Now, that's fascinating. And, and physician behavior generally, yeah, give me 1%, maybe I'll pay attention to it. Cut me an eighth of a quarter of a tenth of a percent, I'm out of here. So docs do not like to see payment go down. And so Medicare, I think they've done a very smart thing. If you really want to get docs to pay attention, after the fourth year, payment goes down. So watch for the next two years, eh, a little bit of sleepiness on the part of docs. At some point, beginning in around three, four, certainly the fifth year, you will see a bunch of physician practices. Now, what does that mean? That means you walk into the doc's office. They, have, they don't ask you for the fifth time where you live, what your date of birth was. They know who you are. They know what your allergies are. They ask you to update them. There's a computer sitting there. And in the best of all worlds, this isn't just about record keeping. This is about providing advice to doctors, nurses, and other caretakers about what to do in complicated patients. So this is not just let's you know call something up in the middle of the night and look at the x-ray. This is advice on how better to take care of patients. The, the words cookbook has been used over and over again, but like 20 years ago of, gee, cookbook medicine means there are guidelines. Got to have a cookbook these days because medicine has gotten very, very complicated, and there are guidelines. There are ways in which docs say, okay, this is a better, this is the preferred way to practice. Well, you want to put those into an electronic medical record. So, elect Standards of care. Sir. Standards of care. There you go. So, administrative waste. What else? Uh, defensive medicine. Okay. Absolutely true. So malpractice, fears of getting sued. Uh, I'll tell you a story in a minute about a program. We'll talk about access in, in a minute. But interestingly, in China, a month ago when I was there talking about starting a new program, they asked about malpractice. They said, well, you're going to put new kinds of healthcare workers in, and we're worried about them getting sued. So even in China. So malpractice, big deal. It is, and, and we go on forever, and I'm standing between you and dessert. Um, it is very difficult to tell whether someone is practicing defensive medicine without asking them. You cannot, and we tried this about 15 years ago before the Office of Technology Assessment went away. About 10 of us were spent a weekend trying to say, can you look at a patient's chart and tell whether the doctor ordered a test because she or he was worried about getting sued? And the answer is no. So you have to ask them. You have to ask about motivation. You have to say, OK, here are a bunch of hypothetical reasons, a bunch of, and they can come up and give doctors you know, 10 different cases and say, what would you do here? and why, but you have to rely on the doctor saying, I would do it 
because I was worried about getting sued. Please know that behaviorally in the same direction is doing more to make money, doing more because I am curious about the outcome, not badly curious, just, you know, I really am uncertain, I want to know. Same direction for doing the right thing. And so, unfortunately, there are a lot of competing things that when people do a lot, you then have to go ask them. And it is a lot easier. There is one study that I just pulled out again last week. It is a lot easier for a doctor to say, I'm going to do it because I'm going to get sued, than to say, I, gee, you know, I have this new machine, and this happens. I have this new machine. I'm in private practice. The person, the salesperson that sold me the machine said I have to do 14 of these per week in order to figure out how to pay this back with the depreciation. They do that. It is impossible that that doesn't enter into people's thinking. So it's complicated. Let me tell you that, yes, financial stimulus does have something to do with doctors doing stuff. We think about Canada as being sort of the, you know, the land of, you know, single payers, non-US. When they first put in the Canadian healthcare system in the 1950s, what they did was they froze prices. And the next year, that's all they did. They just froze prices. And the next year, the volume went up 6%. Trust me, Canadians did not get 6% sicker. Okay, so in fact, physicians in different parts of the world, certainly in this hemisphere, do, and they don't think about it most of the time, but in fact, the stimuli to do things are not as clear that we're going to do this because I'm going to get sued, I'm going to do this because I've got to pay this machine back, I'm going to do this because I'm not sure about the outcome of the patient. Complicated but true. Okay, what else? Waste. What else? How are we wasting money? CEO salaries. Ah, CEO salaries. <laughs> Provost salaries. Oh. <laughs> Uh, people, it, first of all, yes, all right, that falls into overhead, and it's, again, um, yes, it's a little hard to know baseball players' salaries, CEOs' salaries, it's a little, you know, a little hard to know where that, where to draw that line, but yes, there is, uh, there, the guy that um, finished being the CEO of United Healthcare, four years ago, I was having dinner with, and after not much on my side and a lot of red wine on his side, talked about his 500 million in stock options that he left with. So there's real money there. Okay, what else do we waste? Yeah. So inappropriate care or inappropriate billing? A little more. Is that right? Okay, here's the one, here's the big one, all right? So there's administrative waste, there's profits, there's malpractice. There is, across the United States, between a four and ten times variation in the intensity of what doctors do in different parts of the country. The rate of coronary bypass surgery in Miami, Florida is four times per 100,000 the rate in Salem, Oregon for the same sick patient. Same results three years later. Back surgery is 10 times, right? Spinal fusion, 10 times the variation. Same result three years later. 
Therefore, the presumption is if you have the same result and you do more, you didn't need to do it. That number, here's statistic, if you think about U.S. medical care spending, year in, year out, it's between 3 and 3.5% 3 and higher than general inflation. So many years, it's twice as high, right? So general inflation is 3%. Medical inflation on top of it is 3%, so it's 6%. If you take the, come back to you in a minute, if you take the national average of 3.5% and you practice the way medicine is practiced in San Francisco, not in Boise, Idaho, in San Francisco, that's 2.4%. So the, raise, the, ri the rate of rise in San Francisco is slower than the average in the country, $100 billion a year. $100 billion a year because doctors are overdoing stuff for all the reasons we just talked about. But docs are overdoing stuff. Yes, sir? Great question. Um, everyone, and are you saying, are there any? Uh, I'm not aware of really, and, and I'm sure somebody will say, what about? OK, but in general, prostatectomy for prostate cancer or prostate hypertrophy hysterectomy for fibroids. Um, cancer seems to be a little bit more standardized, but still then, the rate of mastectomy very different in different parts of the country. Now, why is a really interesting question, but it will be very interesting what is being said in Washington is they are going to pay doctors differently in the next five years, and they're going to quit paying doctors as much on everything you do, you get paid for. That's called fee for service. And they're talking about really complicated things of bundling services where if you have a heart attack, you get paid a certain amount, you're done. So we'll see the extent to which, if doctors are not paid fee for service, that changes, in fact, the, the difference from one part to the other. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Um, it is a combination of patient-induced demand and doctor-induced demand, and they're both correct, right? We've got to fix both. I, I, the program, and I'll go very quickly through this. What's the difference between access and coverage? Who knows the difference between access and coverage? Which, there you go. Well, okay. So, access, a little more. You're about there. What's coverage? When people say, yeah, people say you've got coverage, what's that mean? Other than wearing a coat because it's cold. Okay, coverage, there you go. Coverage very simply means somebody else is paying the bill. No, 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 that, that's too simple. No, it's not, because even if people have self, if they are self-insured and they get real sick, somebody else is paying the rest of that bill. So even if you're self-insured, if you have insurance, either private or the government is paying for you, Medicare, Medicaid, SCHIP, State Children's Health Insurance Program, county hospitals, all kinds of stuff, that's coverage. Access means you can get to the right person at the right time. It has nothing to do with coverage. So who can think of a time 
or a situation where a patient has 100% access and no coverage. Hmm? You might say Medicaid. Medicaid is, but what happens? Okay, so they've got Medicaid, and that's well, coverage and no access. So are there parts of New York State with coverage and no access? Medicaid has a better record of access than a lot, but the, the problem is now the doctors don't want to pay. So, um, so that's yes, right. So med that's... So that's coverage and no access. And it's access. Well, or no if access doctors, if they don't. If the doctors would get the hell out of their system, uh -oh. then, if, then they would have access. All right? <laughs> okay, what's the classic no ac lots of access, no coverage? Go ahead. But that's, uh, well, not in a lot of hospitals can you get somebody to do that without guaranteed payment. Okay, emergency rooms, now called emergency departments, right? Anybody can walk in off the street and get care in an emergency department. Access, 100% access, no coverage. We have a federal law that guarantees people who go into emergency departments and can get care. Now, you'll remember the last president talked about that being enough. You know, we don't have a problem, he said, because people can always go to the emergency department. Can you get your diabetes medicine? No. Can you get your preventive care? No. Can you get your mammogram? No. Can you get your follow-up care after your heart attack? A little. So no, right? Emergency departments are not where you take care of people in the long run. So no, ac no coverage, initial access. The flip side of no access, plenty of coverage, I assume there are parts of New York State like that where you just can't get to somebody. We certainly have that in southwest Virginia, out in the coal fields, west of Detroit. Virginia goes a long way out there. And they can be four or five hours from a dock. So one thing, and, and this is just a little bit of fun, and I told President Scorton I'd tell you about it real quick, is the notion of providing access by having a core of grandparents, this is real, okay, a core of people who have taken care of two generations of their children and their children's children to work in their own communities to provide care that a good grandparent could take care of. So colds, sore throats, vomiting, diarrhea, sprained ankles, stuff that a good grandparent could do in their own underserved area. They get trained, they get given a mini computer. The mini computer has protocols in it. The protocols have electronic medical records associated with them. The mini computer has a telephone, has Skype telephone, has video so they can get back to a nurse in the middle of the night if they need to, and we pay them $20,000 a year. So that's being tested in Virginia, Mississippi, Houston, Shanghai, Beijing, Inner Mongolia, and Lesotho, Africa. That's access, and trust me, as we get further, I hope, and I'm not sure, and I hope there are those of you in the room that are sure, I'm not, about what's gonna happen in the next year with Washington, but we will, if everybody has an insurance card, we will still have a problem with access. We will still not be able to provide appropriate care to numbers of people. The number in Massachusetts, 400,000 people, after they got coverage, 
were found to have trouble getting access to a primary care doc. Well, guess what? Maybe they don't need to see a primary care doc as often as they think they do. So we'll see. That's the difference between coverage and access. Okay, are you ready to get your teeth ground? Because this one always gets people. Preventive care saves money. How many true? How many false? Preventive care saves, Preventive care saves money. I would say. There you go. False? False? Okay, go. False. I would say maybe it comes to health, but also to quality. So it might cost more to prevent illness than it would good after a surgery. Or if you have a good doctor, it probably gives you better outcomes if you start early. I think I already said that one, but I don't remember. You sure did. Okay, who else said no? Who said yes? This is one of the, this is one of the great half truths. So it's both. I said yes. Because got an example? Uh, I mean I think that there's a lot of evidence <clears> that generally speaking, you know, preventing things like uh, long term smoking from um, obesity, I mean it's basically preventing chronic diseases that occur in life. Okay, so here's it's <laughs> This is why people, okay, let me, if I say it three times, we'll remember it. Preventive care is the right thing to do. <clears throat> yes, please. Right? It's the right thing to do. It saves people's lives. It keeps them alive well, longer, for, you know, terrific. But in the macro sense, it does not save money. Here are two examples. A study from Holland last year. Total health care costs after the age of 20 looked at their entire population. Smokers die at 77 and save $100,000 in medical care costs compared to non smokers who die at 83. Obese people die at 80 and save $50,000 in care costs compared to non obese people <laughs> who die at 83. Just came out last week, a study in Arizona where they start, and they would not. What they said was smokers in, and this is going to be really interesting if anybody picks it up. Medicare, the, the, the data are that smokers die 10 years earlier than non smokers. Now, they said, this is US, the heck with Holland. They did not say what the savings were, but they said their savings. Now, you will remember the, drug, the cigarette companies paid Medicaid. Now, that's going to be real interesting if, in fact, the cigarette companies should be paid by Medicaid. <laughs> so uh, I'm not advocating. <laughs> Please don't, you know, let's, let's come back to, right, let's come back to what I'd like you to remember, right? Preventive care is the right thing. Um, personal story, I've had two parents die of lung cancer. No, thank you. You do not want to die that way. So smoking is horrible. Okay, being overweight, there is a, if you're morbidly obese, there is a 28% reduction in the amount of work you do from day to day. This isn't just medical care costs. Okay, so prevention's the right thing. The study that came out last February 14th, 2008, in the New England Journal of Medicine, some very good people, including a Nobel Prize winner, looked at whether preventive care saves money or does not, and 81% of preventive care costs money, 19% saves money. And they looked at a bunch, 160 or something things. Which were the ones that saved money? Oh, measles vaccination. Okay, measles vaccination, not all, vac not all um, vaccinations, but measles vaccination is the one that people talk about because what happens with measles is you don't die. You get something called encephalitis. I gotta be real careful. I, <laughs> I wrote an op-ed in USA Today right after this thing came out and I said you don't die from measles and some pediatrician literally 
called up the editor of USA Today and said, of course you die from measles. Well, yes, you do, but one case in the last seven years in the United States, so they printed a retraction. So in general, you do not die from measles. <laughs> in general, you get, if you get something awful, it's encephalitis. Encephalitis is a long-term care problem, and you do not die from it, and so it is very expensive. So the reason, or a reason, that measles vaccination saves money is if you don't vaccinate people, a certain percentage of them are going to get encephalitis. Um, some of the asthma preventive care is that, that's coming out now saves money because you don't die in, in one way or the other, and so it saves money in terms of emergency room visits. Some of those things are out there. But a lot of the things that we would like to think of, why? because you apply preventive care to a lot of people who don't need it, okay? So that's one of the reasons. As we get better at determining who needs to take statins, right now all we know is that you have a certain cholesterol and therefore there is an association of a high cholesterol with heart and vascular disease, so everybody with that cholesterol. Well, it can't possibly mean that everybody with that cholesterol needs it. But until we get better at genetic testing, protein testing, everybody's going to get it. Okay, so good thing, right thing to do. Let me end this with my father's statement on when he was 83. And he said, you know, in aging, what you really want to do is have early old age last as long as possible and late old age last 15 minutes. <laughs> now, if we can make that happen, then preventive care saves money. Okay, uh, if I've got it right, literally we got five, six minutes before the food shows up. Is that right, folks? Okay. Let's finish, and I think you know this one. Let's there is a federal safety net for the uninsured, federal safety net for the uninsured who have no money. How many true? How many false? How many are too tired to care? <laughs> federal safety net, federal program, if you have no money that will provide medical care for you if you're uninsured. How many true? How many false? <laughs> Here's the answer, okay? Between the ages, Ginny, between the ages of 19 and 64, unless you are blind, disabled, have kidney disease, or pregnant, or all four at the same time, <laughs> or any combination, you are not covered by federal statute. Now, states can vary that, but by federal statute, New York State has changed that. By federal statute, there is no safety net for the uninsured between the ages of 19 and 64. That's why we've got, and I suspect you will hear that number, 50 million uninsured, awfully quickly. We had 46 and we had 45 last year. The odds are pretty good, and I was talking to some, you've got some very good people here. This is fun. I had a fun day. Thank you, President Scorton. Um, you know, the, odd, the question of whether if you lose your job in this time period over the last six months, did those people have more, were they more likely to have health insurance than people that lost their jobs three years ago? Probably not, but I'll bet you we get to 50 million uninsured. Just so you're clear, that's more than the population of Canada and Australia. It's a lot of people. So the, the notion, real quick, the, the notion of what's going to happen, right? The last chapter of the book says, we'll never see substantive change around here. And we think, Carolyn and I, who we had brains and brawn, I wrote the book and 
five weeks and then Carolyn made it right. So that was the important part. Uh, the last chapter says, you know, nothing's going to happen, there's nothing we can do, and we think that's a myth. My, you know, we got some stars that we thought were aligned, and then we have a budget issue. Um, my suspicion is we will have legislation. I mean, you'll see it, and it'll probably, two bills in the Senate, one bill in the House, and it should come down to policy for the United States saying this is absurd that we have anybody who doesn't have coverage. Now, access is another issue, as we've heard. I don't think there is yet the anger in the United States quite yet to carry the day. So I'm hoping, right, because what it's, it's it sort of, I don't want to take it anymore, and, and I think there's a lot out there right now, it was coming, a lot out there with the economy, um, and we'll just have to see. But it is going to take the American public saying this is awful. It's not about 50 million uninsured saying it, it's about the rest of us saying it. And given all the other pressures going on right now, I wish it were different, but it may not be. So that the old biologic term, chemical term, the energy of activation, what's going to be required to get over that hump, I hope we get there, but stay tuned. We'll see. But the American public are going to have to want it. Nice people. President, thank you.